Hi, everyone. If you're just joining the call now, we'll be getting started shortly. We're going to allow a moment for everyone who's in the waiting room to join the webinar. Thank you. All right, if you're just joining, uh, just a note that we're going to give uh, everyone a bit of a moment as we're allowing participants into the webinar. We'll get started in just a minute. All right, that minute is up. Let's get started. Uh, my name is Kirk Kipka. I'm the Chief Impact Officer at Apparel Impact Institute. I'm thrilled to be joined today by esteemed panelists who will be providing support and updates uh, regarding uh, the Roadmap to Zero, which was a report that AII released along with our partners at WRI a couple of years back. And we're here to share updates uh, based on uh, new data and new insights that have become available uh, with uh, a report or a, a revised port report, which will go live officially today. Um, so as mentioned, I'm Kurt. I'm joined here with Michael Sadowski, an advisor and key contributor and developer of this report, along with Beth Jensen, uh, Director of Climate uh, Plus Impact at Texile Exchange, and also uh, Jarell, uh, sorry, Joel Mertens, uh, Director of Hig Product Tools at Sustainable Apparel Coalition. A bit of a, an update on the admin surrounding this uh, meeting. We'll do a brief intro uh, as, I, as I'm providing now, and then Michael will provide an update on the report itself, and then we'll provide time for all of you uh, to ask questions via chat and uh, pass those along to our esteemed panelists. I'll also guide a set of questions for our panelists uh, in order to facilitate a discussion as we get into the Q&A section of this webinar. Uh, a brief um, intro to Apparel Impact Institute. We are a 501c3 organization, and our mission is to identify, fund, and scale, uh, and also measure positive impact for the apparel and fashion sector. Um, as a leading industry convener, uh, you can see the partners that we work very closely, closely with on this call, just to, to name a few. Uh, but we also look at multi-stakeholder initiatives in order to drive appropriate impact with applied funding uh, wherever it's needed and, and most, um, most likely to drive um, positive change for the sector. Uh, I'm excited to, to bring forward this update to the Roadmap to Zero report with all of you today. Uh, and I'm happy to turn the, the presentation over to Michael to walk us through uh, the report findings thus far. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Kurt. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone, wherever you are uh, in the world. I'm really pleased to spend maybe the next 20 minutes to talk about the report um, that we just launched today as a follow up to the first roadmap to net zero. Um, you know, I, I reference um, this first slide um, just to really set the context for what we're dealing with, um, frankly, as a as a society, as a planet and as a sector. So, you know, we have folks on the line from around the world and um, no doubt you've seen headlines wherever you are about the impacts that we're seeing today on climate, whether it's record heat in Asia, where a, a good portion of the world's apparel and footwear is produced to you know wildfires in North America. Um, to drought in Europe. Um, the impacts of climate are not uh, coming years from now, they're, they're happening now. So this is really the context and the urgency with which we have to act. Um, in March, uh, folks may have seen that the IPCC put out its latest report, um, the sixth assessment report. Um, it's a long report. Uh, WRI did a really nice blog, which is linked on this site, um, but really the the synthesis of the, the sixth report, according to WRI and others, is that um, we've already warmed uh, just over a degree Celsius, and we're already seeing um, severe impacts from that. Um, so we see these impacts, droughts, heat waves, other weather events, uh, and these will continue to worsen. Um, it's not just an environmental issue, it's a, it's a human um, issue. Inequity will get worse. Um, and frankly, every half a degree um, makes a difference, which I'll talk more about in a moment. Um, you know, we have to make the transition away from fossil fuels as quickly as possible. So, um, you know, we're not seeing urgent enough action um, across sectors, and we'll talk more about the apparel sector, obviously. 
Um, reductions are critical, but then I think the report was very clear that, you know, in addition to reduction, we actually have to start removing carbon from the atmosphere, which, um, which you know, raises some other issues, but it's a critical piece of what we have to do to stay within 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see um, the, the reductions that are needed over time to stay within this 1.5 uh, tr degree trajectory. So, so the science is clear. Um, and I mentioned every half a degree matters or every degree matters in this case. So, so on this um, slide, you can see an excerpt from uh, the blog that I mentioned from WRI. And you know, I, I think that it may not seem like a lot, but when you go from 1.5 degrees Celsius to two, um, you know, you have, you know, millions more people impacted by drought and millions more people impacted by extreme heat. So, so we're obviously trying to stay within 1.5 degrees Celsius um, and it gets much worse as we go up. So this is really the, you know, the, the scientific background of what we'll talk about today. So for context back in, in 2019, and this is really where all the work started. So Lewis Perkins and I were in a room in Barcelona um, with World Resources Institute and Apparel Impact Institute to launch guidance for the apparel sector to set uh, science-based targets for climate. And at that time, companies were making different claims, different um, commitments around carbon neutrality, climate neutral, even you know climate positive. And at that time, it was really important to bring consistency and clarity to targets um, and to support companies and really give them that guidance for what would a, a science-based target look like for climate? And so uh, back then there were about um, 12 companies with science-based targets. Um, and today we're, we're roughly at about 400 that have either set targets and have them approved or have made those commitments. So I think that's, you know, that should be applauded. I think the apparel and footwear sector um, is probably the leading sector around the world that has science-based targets. So I think um, there's enormous progress that's being made in terms of companies seeing the realities and lining up to make those commitments. Um, we followed that report up. So we set the guidance in 2019 and really that was a, um, you know, here's how companies should be setting targets. Uh, we worked with WRI and AII in 2021 to produce the roadmap to net zero to really map out how can the sector uh, reduce emissions in line with that 1.5 degree trajectory. Um, in that report, uh, which you can see a screenshot here, we mapped out six key interventions. So things like um, scaling sustainable materials, maximizing energy efficiency, et cetera. Um, and then importantly, we, um, we, we were clear that we would actually repeat this analysis over time because we were working with um, imperfect data when we put out this report. Um, and we promised to keep uh, revising an analysis so that we can bring in the best available data that we have. I think important context back in 2021, there were probably three or four other estimates of apparel um, uh, sector greenhouse gas emissions ranging from 4% to 10%. And what we wanted to do with the roadmap in 2021 was to, to use what we believe to be the best available data. So textile exchange, fiber volume data and pig MSI data to come out with a number that we felt was, you know, was more defensible and reasonable and that we could um, update over time. So that was the context that this was launched in 2021. And again, we, we agreed to, to refresh this. So this report that was just launched today is a refresh of that analysis. Um, last report used um, uh, calendar year 2019 data. Um, this new report uses calendar year 2021 data. And so we refresh the estimate for sector emissions. Um, again, we use data from Textile Exchange and Worldly slash SAC, so the HIG MSI. Um, and then we also, so one half of the report is the, um, the refreshed analysis, and the other half is examples of companies and organizations that are taking uh, concrete action to reduce emissions across those six interventions. Um, we thought it was really important to showcase the progress that's being made. And, and to be clear, we all believe that more, much more needs to be made, right? This is a massive undertaking and we need to hold the sector accountable. You know, and we wanted to use examples to show that um, the sector is actually making progress to, to stay within 1.5C. So that's the background for this report. So uh, just a reminder of the, the way we approach the, the math on, on this. And so we worked with Textile Exchange and, and Worldly slash SAC 
to um, leverage the MSI and, and textile exchange data to calculate the footprint across the four tiers um, of the value chain. Um, and so you can see this illustrated here. So essentially taking the, the volume of fiber that's being used in the apparel sector and cascading that through, through the value chain. Um, so you can see that here. Um, and as we wrote in the, the original roadmap, um, we are very clear that the data that we are using is imperfect um, and needs to be improved. And so, you know, we know that um, using lifecycle data of any kind, including the MSI, you know, has limitations. It may not be representative of actual uh, industry data, but we believe it's the best we have. And we believe it gives us a, a good enough basis to understand where the emissions are, um, which can guide the sector for um, reduction opportunities. Um, you know, we also know that over time, and we again mentioned this in the first report and reiterated it in this new report, that we want to swap out the secondary data over time with primary data. So whether that's through data sets like the FEM or the new um, factory data tool that Worldly is putting out, you know, we know ultimately that um, we need better data um, in this sector. Um, and we also know enough to say that even though the data is imperfect, we know where the hotspots are and we know what needs to happen. So what we don't want to have happen is data um, paralyze us from moving forward on, on this, um, on reducing emissions. Um, but obviously we can continue to approve that over time. Um, in the right-hand box, um, the, the key assumption that we made or the change in assumptions that we actually worked with Textile Exchange to refine the fiber allocation amount that went to apparel. And so in the last report, we had a blanket assumption that two thirds of all fiber um, produced or grown went to apparel. Um, and we frankly got better data this time around from Textile Exchange. So we, we revised those figures and then we actually um, back calculated the 2019 figures to reflect that. So, so again, you know, that was part of our plan all along that as we move along and get better data, we're actually gonna reflect that in our analysis. Okay, so the results. So um, the headline figure, so for 2021 calendar year, um, total apparel sector emissions, um, 0.897 gigatons, or if you um, wanna see it another way, 896 or 7 million tons. Um, if, if you wanna frame this in terms of percentage of global emissions, it's roughly 1.8%. Um, as we write in the report, again, this is our best estimate. Um, I think it's important to say that um, when you look at some of the numbers that have put, put out in the past, 8%, 10%, I saw a headline the other day that said that the apparel sector um, is 20% of European um, emissions, which, you know, having worked in other sectors, those numbers are just um, not plausible. And so for us, again, we'll get better over time, but apparel sector emissions are in the 1.8% range. Um, in terms of the breakdown of hotspots, um, tier two, um, like it was in 2019, remains the biggest um, source of emissions. Just over half of, of all value chain emissions come from um, things like dyeing and finishing um, the materials that go into product. Um, tier four, so cotton production, extraction of uh, fossil fuels for, um, for polyester and, and nylon, uh, about a quarter, and then you can you can see tier three and, and tier one um, are, are lower. Um, as we look at these numbers, I think it's important to note that the energy source for each of these tiers um, is, is quite different. So tier two, um, there's quite a bit of coal that's used for, <clears throat> excuse me, thermal energy production um, and, and less so electricity, whereas tier three is primarily electricity. So um, that matters in terms of how we think about decarbonizing um, different sectors. So the change from 2019 to 20, 2021, so a slight increase, uh, which you can see on the left-hand side, um, which I think is promising. Um, and obviously we've got to reduce emissions, right? Even a small increase um, is going, going the wrong way, but you can see some of the reasons why on the right-hand side um, that we're seeing this small increase. Um, but again, um, emissions are, are just under a gigaton um, and um, that will continue to be refined over time, um, as well as the background data will, you know, will be will refined over time. So you can see some of those, those revisions that we made um, on the right-hand side. So, so again, you know, slight increase um, from, from 2019 to 2021, you know, and we've got to bend that the other way and start reducing significantly. 
Um, you can see that uh, we had this, this graph in the first report, but we've revised this with the new data. Um, so we're you know 0.89 or so gigatons today. Um, we've got to get that down to, to no more than 0.49 gigatons by 2030. Okay, so, so significant work to be done. Um, I'm sure we'll have a good conversation in the Q&A about, about how do we do this, but, um, but um, this is the trajectory that we're on and how we need to bend this. And by the way, I, I do see some uh, questions coming in the Q&A and I appreciate those. We will get to those as we, um, as we get to the Q&A later. Um, so the, the data that we have developed through this work um, is one of three data points that the industry we want is using to measure progress um, for the sector on sustainability. So as you can see, <clears throat> the greenhouse gas emissions on the right-hand side, that's their environmental indicator. And they have also, they also have indicators on wages and purchasing practices. So, so every year as the industry we want updates this data, we're gonna provide a refreshed uh, emissions number for this analysis. Great. So um, just to get into the second half of the report. Um, so what we did here in the report, and again, you can, you can look at this in, in detail. We just have snippets from a couple of companies per lever. Um, we looked across the six interventions and just tried to provide good examples of companies that are making progress on each of these levers. And we chose companies and we can only, you know, given the, you know, we've, we had limited space in the report, we could only choose three to five examples per lever. Um, but there are many, many examples that we could have profiled in this report. Um, but we just wanted to provide a diversity of examples in terms of companies. We wanted to mix apparel brands and manufacturers. And so I'll go through a few of these, um, but just note that um, you know, we're, not, we're not claiming these are the only examples or these are perfect examples, but they're meant to give other companies inspiration and direction on, on what can, can happen. Uh, and so I'll just tick through a few of these um, on, on this slide. You know, ASOS, like other companies, are um, trying to solve, you know, the, the issues that come with, you know, um, overproduction, whether it's samples or um, overproducing products that, that never get sold, as well as just designing out waste um, in the production process. So using um, technology to um, minimize and, and eliminate waste in the process, which has not gone carbon benefits. Um, similar work that Nike has done with, with this new product, Nike Forward. Um, and then you can see Cytex manufacturer, some of the you know, um, tremendous uh, emissions reductions and, and other impact areas that can be had through, through new technology in dyeing. So, so material efficiency um, is, is one lever. And again, you can read more about these in the report. Um, scaling sustainable materials and processes. Um, Beth is on the line and I know she'll talk a bit more later about textile exchanges work in getting companies to scale up what are known um, solutions in, in sustainable materials, but but I would say that um, you know this is something that is is accessible and and real today, where companies can access things like recycled polyester, better cotton, organic cotton, recycled nylon. These are materials and solutions that that can be had today. So you can see on the slide, you know, just um, some really impressive um, material substitution efforts from the likes of Lululemon, um, as well as H and M. Um, and ISCO. So in this example, you know, you can go to textile exchange website and see the, the work they've done on recycled polyester and the challenges and other materials. But, but these are known solutions today that companies can take to, to reduce their, their footprint. Um, and this is really a tier four reduction opportunity. If you're swapping out virgin fossil fuel with recycled, um, there's a definite benefit to doing that. So that's sustainable materials. Um, next generation materials. So in, in the first report, I would say that we were projecting what could be with, with some of these next generation materials and processes. But I think, um, you know, in this version, we're starting to see some of these things, um, you know, be more real. And so, you know, a number of, of companies, for example, are exploring, you know, what maybe were very far out technologies, you know, capturing carbon dioxide and turning those into the building blocks for new materials. And so Lanzatech you know, working with Lululemon and On Running and Zara and others to actually capture waste gas and turn those into a building block. So that for me is incredibly exciting. And there's just so much potential to that, along with textile recycling and recycling cotton waste like Lensing is doing. Um, I also think it's worth noting that um, 
there are these advanced technology companies, but there are also efforts like the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol, um, which are working with a, you know, a significant um, number and acreage, uh, number of farmers, but acreage of, of farms to actually you know, reduce emissions through better farm practices. And so it's not just the, you know, the, the you know, far out innovative materials and, and companies, but it's actually what can be done on the ground um, just through diligent work. So really important to highlight, highlight that. Um, energy efficiency. So, you know, importantly, you know, manufacturers see this as an economic issue, right? So you can see some of the examples here through TAL, TAL apparel, excuse me, and then elevate. Um, there are, you know, actual savings today that can be had through investments in more efficient boilers, capturing waste heat, um, you know, more efficient um, processes overall in the manufacturing supply chain. So, you know, this is, this is you know, real savings, and, and Kurt can speak later to his experience with Clean by Design, but um, these are things that should be done, frankly, first before we get to renewables and, and swapping out of coal, um, because they save money and they reduce emissions today. So, so again, important to note, to note that. Um, just a couple more slides. Eliminating coal in manufacturing. So, you know, um, I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, in Tier 2, um, there's an awful lot of coal that's being used for thermal processes, so heating water for um, dyeing and finishing. Um, not as easy as, as maybe finding renewable sources of electricity. Um, and so, you know, you've got companies that are phasing out coal and making commitments. So you have H&M that has, um, has said, you know, we won't onboard any new suppliers if they're using on-site coal from January 2022, so last year. Um, you have Nike um, that um, has all of their, nearly all of their tier two materials vendors with coal elimination plans in place. Um, so, and, and they're working, and those companies and others are working with their vendors to test different solutions, whether it's biomass, which we know with Arvind, um, electrification, which is really promising, and just different technology. So this is a really thorny challenge getting out of coal for thermal and um, I think it's really important that companies like H&M and Nike and others um, are working in concert with vendors to actually figure out where to go with this. So, so that's coal. Um, on renewable electricity, um, this one, again, depending on where you are in the value chain, you know, tier one, tier three, maybe more electricity dependent as a, as a source, but you've got tremendous um, work being done in the supply chain. So I'll just, on this one, highlight what Lensing has, has done. So, you know, shifting production facilities to 100% renewables, um, and then also building a pretty, you know, pretty big PV facility in Austria. So um, this is not an easy task to, to bring renewables to an industrial process. So I think kudos to them, kudos to Arvind, um, you know, putting a 16 megawatt solar array on a, on a facility, um, is significant. So we're well beyond with this work, you know, pilots or partial solar, these things are, are real, they're big, and they're going to be impactful as we as we look forward. Um, on the right hand side, I just noted how, um, excuse me, how important advocacy is. So you've got the likes of Nike and Amazon and Apple coming together to try to shift the policy regime in Asia and, and really work to deploy more renewables. So so it's not just technology, it's the policy piece. And I would say the, the companies in the apparel sector are working to try to shift policy in places like Indonesia, Vietnam, et cetera. Okay. So, so yeah, just as I close and as I pass it back to Kurt for, <clears throat> excuse me, for uh, a panel discussion with Joelle and Beth, I'll just, I'll just end with saying that we, we know what to do, right? And so, the six levers that I just walked through and some of the examples um, just make it clear that we, we know that we, we have certain levers at our disposal um, and there are things that companies can do today. And, and there are certainly things they can invest in to help shape what things look like in the future, for example, policy or, or next generation materials. But I wanted to impress upon the audience that um, that there are things that um, companies are doing and can do more of to, to bend that carbon curve um, in the right way. So, so that was a bunch. The report is live. Um, I think we may have a link to it at the end of this. If not, we'll get it out. But I'm going to pass it over to Kurt to lead a panel discussion.
Thanks so much, Michael. Um, with that, uh, I want to go directly to Beth. You alluded to this, Michael, uh, the, the challenge of, of urgency to take bold action and how Textile Exchange Climate Plus strategy is informing that. So I want to ask you, Beth, um, can you tell us more about this strategy and how the initiative is progressing? Sure. Yeah. So um, for those who may not be aware, just very briefly, Textile Exchange, we are a global nonprofit organization supporting the apparel, fashion, textile, and footwear sector in use of what we would call preferred raw materials and fibers um, and everything that goes along with that in terms of, of tracking volumes in the industry, tracking impact related to those materials, uh, the usage of those materials in the industry, et cetera. Um, so... Uh, Kurt, you mentioned our Climate Plus strategy. Um, and so what that's really about is to say, yes, we absolutely need to be focused on climate and greenhouse gas emissions reduction related to raw materials and fibers usage in our sector. Um, that's absolutely a North Star. And particularly in tier four of our industry supply chain, it's also really important to, to ensure that we have a holistic perspective on impact. So looking at other interdependent impact areas like biodiversity, soil health, and water alongside climate, you know, as well as social impacts, animal welfare impacts, um, um, indigenous rights uh, in farming, uh, farming communities, et cetera. So um, there's a lot of different things that we're doing that are aligned with this strategy and that are supporting the industry in achieving this strategy and ultimately achieving our goal of 45% emissions reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions related to um, uh, production of raw materials and fibers in the textile and apparel sector by 2030. Um, a few of the, the things that we're doing to support the industry on this are, uh, we've launched a community of practice um, around regenerative agriculture, um, and we'll be looking to launch a different additional communities of practice moving forward to really make sure that we're convening the industry um, and sort of cutting through the swirl of all of the different uh, sort of discussions that are happening on the topic. Uh, we published our regenerative agriculture landscape analysis report last year, and we are about to publish um, the biodiversity landscape analysis mm -hmm. report in the coming months. Um, and that provides a really good sort of found foundation and grounding on the topic and, and how to move forward with that as a one of the levers that we can pull to achieve our climate targets. Um, we have a number of impact tools that are coming out, our preferred fiber and materials matrix and our materials impact explorer tools are coming out later this year. Um, we're putting a lot of effort into impact data. So both uh, an LCA and what we would call an LCA plus approach going along with that. So we can chat more about that later in the, the Q&A. Um, we have our, our individual fiber roundtables. So our animal fibers roundtable and our cotton roundtable and our manuate cellulosics and synthetics roundtables. And then of course, our ongoing development of our standards um, and our unified standards system uh, that's under development now and that just went out for public consultation several weeks ago. Uh, and then we're tracking progress on all of this through our materials market report, which is um, the, the foundation for the volume data that's used here in this roadmap to net zero report, as Michael mentioned earlier. We also have as textile change our own dashboards to track broader in industry progress using that volume information and overlaying it with impact information. And then, of course, we also have our corporate benchmark program, and that's where companies um, can report their individual sort of progress, and we can get a sense of sort of more from a um, an industry leadership point of view and a specific company point of view, uh, how are we progressing against our targets? So there's a lot that's happening on this um, and, and much more to come. But, um, you know, I think the roadmap to net zero is really our sort of what we point to for the overall industry view on what we need to do and where we need to go related to GHG impact reduction specifically. And we're, we're really pleased to, to help support it. Thanks so much, Beth. Um, one thing that the organizations on this call have committed to is an annual report to track that progress, both in terms of where the industry is trending, but also where initiatives like what Beth just described are trending and how they're progressing as well, um, which I think is one of the key opportunities as identified in this report. There are um, identified opportunities for improvement, um, solutions that have been applied within the sector, great case studies, uh, but there is a real need for further coordination uh, across the industry for what's working and effectively scaling those solutions that are most effective. And I applaud Textile Exchange for being a part of that coordination. 
Um, on that note, Joel, I want to turn it over to you. I know this isn't necessarily um, within your realm of responsibilities, but I'm curious to know uh, a little bit more about the decarbonization program and how that will also help to drive the coordination uh, of the kind of efforts that are going to sufficiently scale activities across the sector. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. Um, yeah, so SAC has launched uh, our decarbonization program, and really what this is, is looking to uh, drive SBT adoption across the industry and use collaboration and partnership as a means to reduce <laughs> emissions across the fashion industry. Uh, notably, I think in the tier one, tier two, and maybe tier three space, but really I'd say focused on tier one and tier two. We know that these are, are areas, especially tier two, where there are a lot of emissions. So how do we uh, have have the collective action of, of brands and manufacturers to really drive the, the improvements that we need to see. So if we're looking at coal phase out or, or renewable energy adoption, these, these can be scaled much faster if there's, there's more people at the table. Um, and of course, the measurement part of that. So how we support individual companies, whether they're manufacturers or whether they're brands, retailers in, in setting, their, um, setting their scope three uh, targets and, and then tracking against that um, using uh, amongst other things, the, the Hagenic suite of tools. So we have, of course, the facility tools where uh, we can get to specific uh, activity data of what's happening in the facilities. You know, so if they're adopting you know, new boilers or anything there, that's going to show up in reduced emissions on their side. And then continuing to invest in uh, the, the LCA side of things for uh, emission factors as well. So we have uh, working groups on um, cotton as well as on uh, textile wet processing. We're both looking at how we standardize and scale uh, LCA templates to really drive at the processing level uh, consistency to remove bias error and enable uh, continuous updating over time. Thanks, Joel. And of course, what you're describing fits right in the wheelhouse of AII's priorities as an organization as well. And we look forward to working closely with SAC on the decarbonization program and how we can um, coordinate those activities further across the industry, connecting data with the interventions and ultimately the verified results coming from those programs over time. Um, shifting gears a bit to you, Michael, um, you mentioned earlier that for this report, we made some changes to a key assumption, the percent of fiber that is allocated to the apparel sector. Yeah. Uh, and this had a notable impact on the results. Um, I'm sure that this may cast some um, doubts and critiques on the impact data used in the apparel sector for calculating GHG emissions. Um, mm -hmm. How would you respond to such critiques? Yeah, so um, just to... Um you know, pinpoint the, the change. So we made a we made a change from the 2019 data to 2021 on the percentage of fiber that was allocated to the apparel sector. And um, we we did that because textile exchange had better data this time around, right? And so this really fits with the philosophy that we set out um, two years ago that if we use the HIG MSI um, and textile exchange to start, we would continue to improve the data over time. And so we had access to better data. Um, and so we use that and backcast the, the 2019 figures. Um, and, and I would just say that, you know, if you all work in the apparel sector or know it, you know that data quality is imperfect. And there are lots of debates about, um, do we have good enough data and, um, you know, kind of castigations on certain data sets. And I, I would just say that, um, you know, we think that we're using the best available data. We will continue to improve that over time and swap in primary data because ultimately, I think our collective North Star is, you know, being able to use actual emissions data from every entity across the value chain from finished goods factories all the way back to cotton farms. Um, and again, if you know the sector, you know how incredibly daunting of a task that is, right? There are, you know, a, an average brand probably has hundreds of tier one facilities you know, that and more tier two, and then you get to cotton farming and, and where polyester comes from, like that becomes um, enormous, enormously challenging. And so we're going to continue to improve this data over time. And I think, um, you know, I, I, and I'm biased, but I would say the apparel sector has a much better grasp on data and, and frankly, um, collectively working to improve that data than any other sector that I know. And so I think we're just going to continue to improve this data over time, acknowledging that it's imperfect, but also saying, like, let's not wait for that data to be perfect, right? We know how to reduce emissions. We have known solutions through AII and others. So let's actually act there and work in the background to improve that data. 
Thanks, Michael. Uh, Joel, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this change in impact data and how you see the HIG tools being used to allow companies to gather high quality data over time. Yeah, I think it's it's critical, of course. If we want to measure progress, we can only measure against the the aspects that we're we're actually tracking. Um, and it, I think maybe it's uh, worth noting it's we're not going to, going to ever be able to measure everything, right? If we look at scope three, you're going all the way down to you know the extraction of oil and each individual oil head, and there's going to be a cutoff of kind of what you can include and can't include. But the question is, are we including all the hot spots, and how do we make sure we're using primary data for those? So you know we know we want to track renewable energy, we know we want to track our renewable electricity, coal phase out. These factors are ones that uh, aren't as integrated into the MSI emission factors as we'd like. So when we're when we're doing this analysis and using those emission factors, that's currently one of the limitations, and that's part of why we're we're investing in uh, being able to split specifically the textile web processing data to get it more granular to be able to reflect um, the the differences there, and then using FEM data to also help track the, the adoption rates in, in different facilities to still give that industry overall picture. So I think there is a lot of, of uh, work still to be done in, in collecting some of this primary data at a level that allows it to be integrated into the report on an ongoing basis, because I think that's the other piece here. It has to be ongoing. If we only get a single point in time, it helps, but you're not going to be able to show the progress. So. Uh, yeah, there's there's lots to do and and really look forward to continuing that. And I do think that is going to mean we're going to have to change some of the numbers as we as we go. But being able to reflect where we've made an improvement in data quality is already a win, whether the number goes up or down. Mm -hmm. Well put. Uh, Beth, I'd welcome your thoughts on how Texas Exchange approaches data quality for the Climate Plus strategy and related efforts as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, just to echo, you know, uh, what the previous speaker said about uh, let's not wait, let, let's let's work to get better impact data and continually get better data, um, both volume and impact data um, from the materials perspective, and let's not wait. Um, we know enough to know the direction we need to head in, in terms of impact reduction um, and creating beneficial impacts today. So on the volume data side, as Michael uh, discussed, um, the team here internally at Textile Exchange that works on the materials market report every year, um, which is, you know, again, the basis for this report in terms, this roadmap to net zero report in terms of the volume, the materials volume information that's used. Um, that team is, is in and of themselves continually working to get better data, um, better volume data from the full industry production level. So that, that materials market report looks at total global production of cotton, total, total global production of polyester, um, of all of the materials that are used in our industry. And then the, the great part is that what they've been able to do now, um, just in, in recent years, is start to drill into, well, what is really the industry, our industry's contribution to those total global production numbers? So instead of using the entire global production number of you know, polyester or cotton or, or whatever, we're able to start honing in and refining um, by category what we believe, you know, what's the best available data to indicate what we believe our industry's contribution is. So just to provide a little bit more color on what we talk about when we talk about that refinement that's now pulling through into this um, roadmap to net zero report, that's what we're talking about there. And we'll continue to work on refining not only getting better volume data, but also um, getting better estimates about that um, that industry contribution um, that we are seeing to, to within the different fiber categories. And then on the impact data side, as I mentioned earlier, we have two parallel work streams at Textile Exchange. So we are working on I'm in progress on seven different life cycle assessment studies right now. Um, one, an, an updated one on cotton, an updated one on, on polyester and all the different iterations of polyester, an updated one on cashmere, an updated one on um, a number of different materials. And then, um, and we recognize the limitations of LCA data. It can't cover everything that we, textile exchange would like to cover um, in terms of holistic view of impacts. So then that's where our, what we call our LCA plus approach comes in. And that's where we're looking at setting targets and providing guidance um, in the other impact areas like biodiversity, um, soil health, water health, et cetera. Um, and a number of other, uh, I guess, pieces go into uh, our work on data as well. Um, we're about to release what we call our regenerative outcomes framework to help um, organize the industry around kind of a shared set of 
of outcomes, you know, as we look more toward the idea of outcome measurement versus solely looking at practices in the industry. Um, we have an impact measurement community of, uh, of practice on our hub, community of practice space on our hub, our textile change hub. Um, and we're also looking at integrating outcomes, really impact-based outcomes into the next iteration of our standards. So all that to say, we're doing a lot of work on continually improving the uh, material volume and impact information that we use in the industry. Thanks, Beth and Joel. Uh, that that continued attention on quality data and ensuring that it's accurate data over time is incredibly important to uh, the kind of work which AII and our ecosystem partners seek to achieve in identifying what are the most um, impactful projects if you project them out at scale. And of course, production volumes and material or fiber volumes become a critical part of that um, scale methodology or the models for scale, uh, which we seek to identify identify um, through grant funding or program development processes. All right, one last question for all three panelists before we wrap up and turn it over to the audience for some Q&A. Um, the latest IPP, excuse me, the latest IPCC report, uh, which Michael alluded to earlier, clearly lays out the need for much faster action on climate. What gives you a reason to be optimistic about the apparel sector delivering its part? Uh, and perhaps uh, bonus points, if you can also share uh, what you think needs to happen next or, or what you think is meaningful progress uh, between now and when we release this next report in 2024. Beth, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I'm optimistic about a lot of things here. I I, I think there's been a really marked interest in um, science-based targets and impact data, as as Michael mentioned. You know, um, we now have over 400 companies that are looking at this. Uh, the regulatory and reporting and disclosure landscape is really rapidly evolving. I think that is actually going to be a key lever for the industry. Um, and I think there's also been this broader recognition of what's gotten us here won't get us there kind of mentality related to funding for what's really needed in terms of infrastructure and just big development opportunities in the industry. And that's where I would just put in a plug for the um, Fashion Climate Fund that AII is overseeing, which is really designed to kind of help um, you know, be a more consolidated funding source. Like we know that companies in and of themselves with their sustainability budgets or their um, you know, their existing sort of program budgets, are, it's just not enough. Um, it's not going to be enough to get us to the the really big, meaty infrastructure mm -hmm. investments that we need to see and big, meaty sort of technological and solutions uh, investments that we need to see to help us achieve our target. So um, just the um, emergence of those types of initiatives um, and the the sort of recognition of the funding community um, that, you know, fashion and apparel and textiles is kind of finally getting to be on their radar a little bit um, is really encouraging to me as well. And then I guess I would just say the thing I think about every day is we just, we have to be optimistic about this. We don't have any other choice. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's hard and, and messy work, but, but um, what other choice do we have than to, to keep moving forward and, and try to try to do what we can to achieve our targets. So. Thank you, Beth. And thank you for the plug as well. For more information about the Fashion Climate Fund and also AII's existing programs that are driving impact in the industry, you can go to our website at apparelimpact.org. Um, hopefully, if you're routed to this webinar, you already have visited our website, but shameless plug on my part as well. Um, Joel, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on uh, what gives you optimism and perhaps the, the subsequent steps that you'd like to see between now and the next report. Yeah, it's uh, and maybe I'll start with an acknowledgement that it can be hard to be optimistic in this space, right? We're still seeing our emissions, you know, go up small amount. We're we're getting we're getting there, and that's I think part of the optimism is that we are are bending that curve compared to to where we are. And I think the <clears throat> the real piece that gives me the the optimism is is that we do continue to have that pre competitive collaboration. This is something that um, has has really. I think helped the the industry take action uh, to the point that we're at, and and you know build that that knowledge base and and start to look at how we're going to actually tackle these, and we need to see that collaboration continue into those investments through through the the intervention points that have been uh, wonderfully summarized in the report, um, and I think that's the the 
the next step really is is to say how do we make sure that that collaboration happens we can't just talk about it uh there's been a lot of talk um of, of how we need to do that and and you know the the quality of data is it exactly accurate is it a five percent saving is it a ten percent saving it's a saving we know the intervention points we need to collaborate on that and my hope is by the time that we get to the next year's report that we'll see the uh the, the fruit of that uh, collaboration and from from our side also the corresponding ability to modify those um those emission factors to track that through the calculations and in a, in a more holistic way as well mm -hmm. Thanks. And Michael, I'll land it with you. Yeah. So I would just um, say yes to everything that Beth and Joel uh, just mentioned. Uh, when we wrote the apparel guidance in 2019, uh, I would say this is what, what has happened is exactly what we hoped would happen, right? That the guidance would allow more apparel companies to set science-based targets. Um, it was um, that you know brands really started the, the process back then. I think what gives me a lot of hope is that you now have a lot more manufacturers that are lining up to set targets and make investments um, to reduce emissions. So it's no longer a US or North America or European brand thing. It's actually a global apparel sector um, phenomenon. So I think that for me is really encouraging. Um, I would say that the sector has a really keen appreciation for the fact that this is a systems challenge and they really understand, the sector really understands that if you wanna shift the, the emissions curve down, you've actually got to engage in policy in places like Vietnam, you've got to invest in advanced technology. Um, see the fashion, you know, climate fund, obviously that's been referenced, like there, there's real investment coming in. You know, the headline earlier this year that H&M was setting aside 300 million US roughly to decarbonize in a year. like. For me, those, those these numbers are eye popping, right? And so, like, it's no longer a talk thing. There's actually real action, real action happening um, with brands and manufacturers to decarbonize. Clearly, more has to happen. But but I think in 2023, we're in a much different place and a much better place um, to reduce emissions than we were in, in 2019. Great, thanks, Michael. Um, before we shift to Q and A, uh, just a, a note on my part. Um, I'm I'm optimistic about the momentum. I think it's clear that the momentum is there. The the need for um, action and where that action needs to be um, delivered is clear. Um, I'm particularly excited about translating what have been um, target setting and planning activities over the last couple of years within this industry and turning that into coordinated efforts across organizations across. Um, levels of the supply chain, which we know is needed. Um, we've referenced the Fashion Climate Fund as just one tool that this industry has, but as Michael and the report have um, suggested, there's solutions that exist out there, endless amounts of case studies and opportunities to make meaningful progress. And the organizations included in this um, progress checking on an annual basis are committed to facilitate that process and fill white space opportunities for collective action and driving uh, the data quality and results that ultimately we see the opportunity to achieve between now and 2030. So with that, I'm going to shift over to Q&A from the participants in this call. Yeah. And Kurt, I see one question. And, um, sure. online, which I can address and or that I can start to address. And we encourage others to, to put your questions in the Q&A um, uh, chat there. Um, so there's a question about, are we seeing impacts to existing corporate climate commitments and investments in the sector based on increased legislation like the SEC climate disclosure rules or the FTC and green claims? And, and how do we communicate the risk versus reward to the C-suite? I, I will just say, and others can chime in that I think corporates are absolutely seeing things like what the SEC is proposing, what Europe has proposed, what individual states in certain places like the US are proposing. And that's really background context and pressure for companies to actually have better data um, to produce robust greenhouse gas footprints and to actually start mapping out concrete plans to reduce emissions. Um, so I think that's absolutely critical background for this. I would say the you know the the whole green claims and greenwashing thing is probably a separate track um, that personally makes me a little worried that you have companies that are being um, dinged for using recycled materials. Um, that's a separate conversation. It obviously brings up the notion of having um, you know real good evidence for claims you're making and having 
solid impact data which brands are working on, but I, I think that's a separate, a separate issue. Uh, in terms of the risk and reward to the C-suite, um, I opened the presentation with a slide about the impacts of climate. And if you're a brand or you're a manufacturer and you're either sourcing or making product in, in South and Southeast Asia, I, I think you can see what's happening with, with what's going on with the climate. You know, you know, factories in the future are gonna have a hard time operating when it's you know 120 degrees Fahrenheit or they lack access to water. So, so these risks that maybe you know in 2010 we were talking about coming, they're here. And so I think frankly, you know, it, it shouldn't be too hard to communicate the risk that we all face um, from, from climate. And, and again, I think this is why we're seeing such, um, such action from, from the sector on, on reducing emissions. But Joel, anything or Beth, anything you wanna to add to the, the background regulatory environment or CURT or data, green claims, et cetera? Maybe really quickly, I think, you know, as soon as we get into the disclosure and, and tracking space, this is where it is helpful to, to have that, that shared collaboration on, on what that looks like, because there are many different ways to use data and many different ways to interpret that and, and mix it in ways that um, can, can make it really hard to, to show continuous progress. And, and even this report is, I think, part of that evolution of, of how do we actually continue to, to build on, on the methodology we have to have a kind of standard framework to show mm -hmm. what's changing as opposed to kind of changing all the variables and, and, um, and not accounting for why those changed. Yeah. Great. Okay. We've got a pretty wonky question about whether I'm, the next report will include flag emissions from Robert. Yeah, Street. I've been processing how to approach <laughs> it during this question. Um, yeah. Here's what I'll say about this. I, we are, as textile exchange, I'll, and I'm just speaking from the raw materials perspective specifically, so flag emissions as applied to raw materials extraction and initial production. Um, mm -hmm. We are absolutely watching this um and are you know will be uh, certainly providing sort of um insights and and uh, guidance out to our community as as things become available as these methodologies become um you know come more online and able to be used um in a more robust way i think they're still in pilot um for my yeah. understanding um so so that's one thing to say is that we in order to integrate something like that into our this report, a couple of things come into play here. As Michael mentioned, the data in this report is from 2021, which was gathered in 2022, and now then gathered at this higher level in 2023. So we're on sort of a year and a half lag, two year lag for data um, in this report. Just And maybe we can speed that up in the future, but that's the reality of just the data process today. Um, so so it won't, I would say, you know, if and when, and I'll let the AII team speak to if this report is going to be happening again next year, or if it's every two year process. Um, but next year, it would not be able to be included because we're looking back to, you know, essentially 2022 data for the next report. But certainly at a high level from the textile exchange perspective, it's something we're watching very closely. And this, again, goes back to the idea of how do we start to get more ground truth data versus using, you know, essentially life cycle assessment proxy data and applying that to volumes. Um, yeah. And that's a huge challenge, as we've talked about earlier, in terms of how do you get good ground truth landscape level data, um, mm -hmm. you know, from all of the different landscapes in which we operate as a as an as an industry. So something we're we're actively grappling with is as textile exchange. So watch this space for kind of how we continue to evolve the impact data that we are able to provide in a meaningful way at a broader industry level. Um, the other thing I would say is we do have as textile exchange our corporate benchmark program, which is where companies report in, self-report in on the volumes of materials that they're sourcing and how they're sourcing those materials. And that is a place where I think sort of in the interim, we might be able to start to ask some questions about use of the flag protocol and, and um, you know, and what companies are doing. But then in terms of translating that up to this broader industry level is where we still have some work and, and thinking to do, I think, from a more scientific perspective. But yeah. I'll stop there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Watch this space. Yeah. 
Thanks, Beth. And one thing that I can address there is the ambition we have and intention to do this report on a regular basis, on an annual basis. And so as we look forward to 2024, it's signaling updates in data that we can get into as well, not just revisiting the data that we have, but also where we see opportunities for improved data over time as the report evolves as well. Yeah, Kurt, there's a there's a question in, in the Q&A about, um, will we prepare a disclosure framework where companies can provide performance measures that are cross comparable across companies and products? I mean, Joel, we could make this a separate conversation about how the SAC has worked in Europe and other places on, on this particular topic. It's a thorny one. It's a, frankly, as long as I've worked in sustainability over 20 plus years, like putting data on products has been a challenge that is unsolved. But Joel, I don't know if there's anything you want to provide here um, in, in response to this question. Yeah, maybe briefly, I think there's there's a couple of things. When we look at um, company disclosure frameworks, there's, there's always going to be that tension between standardization and flexibility yeah. to address new new ways of working as as things go up. Um, I think in on the company side, I think that's what we're looking at with the decarbonization guide too, of, of what are the things you can be tracking? What are the ways to do that? That has a little bit of flexibility, maybe pulls in that transparency into how you're doing it, um, but tries to bring some consistency to how companies are doing it, recognizing that realistically, that's still not yeah. going to be comparable between companies, right? There's, there's going to be differences there. And then on the product side, I mean, that's what, that's what, yeah the product environmental footprint project is intending to do in, in Europe as well is to say, how do you standardize this? But it faces the same challenge, right? We can standardize things. And, and I mean, the product module is a good example of this. We've standardized some things, but when you standardize it, you remove the flexibility to, to reflect some, some important parameters sometimes. So it's finding that balance, I think, in, in mm. at, which will also lead to a tension of consistency. You want it to be consistent as possible, but maybe the the light at the end of the tunnel, if you will, be maybe more on the transparency side. How do you explain what you have done so that it it pulls through that narrative on on any uh, any product or or corporate disclosure? Yeah. Great. Okay. Now we're kind of another question coming in here. Let's see. Yep. There we go. Yeah. And obviously, there's experimentation going on in Europe with France putting logos on or labels on products and Norway saying don't. So I think there's some conflict to be to be resolved in different places around the world. Um, we may have another question or two coming in, but as a reminder, we will send out the recording of this webinar as well as the report to everyone on the line uh, by Monday. So, so stay tuned for that. Um, we we'll probably have another minute or so if there are any other questions or Kurt, we can also wrap it up with any reflections from you or, or Beth or Joel. I see one question coming in here. Yeah, just browsing it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Da, da, da. Yes. Um, so there's a question around the transition from coal to other quote unquote transition fuels, whether that's mm -hmm. biomass or gas. And, and we absolutely talk about that in the report that what we're trying to do is reduce emissions, right? So if we shift from, and, but, and reduce emissions, but also not have any unintended consequences elsewhere. Um, so for example, we don't wanna tear down forest to, to produce biomass um, for, for coal um, swap out. So, so it's critical that we're not phasing out coal and having impacts elsewhere. Um, I think you know, we have to be guided by the data. So if you swap out coal for gas, and if gas is even available in a region, which is a, ch a challenge for some countries, like does that improve the footprint? And is that a transition as electrification um, matures, right? Like right today, and, and companies are working on this and heat pump, like I saw a poster earlier this week that H&M is working on heat pumps. And um, so like, there's all sorts of things that are happening, but we're not there yet, right? And so if we wanna get to, you know, half, um, reduce emissions by half by 2030, we've got to look at bridge fuels to get there. And so I think to the, to the question, electrification, I think is the, is the future of, of thermal processes um, and maybe you know, alternative ways of dying. But you know, within the next five to 10 years, there, there will be bridge fuels, fuels and we have to really be mindful that they're not worse or have unintended impacts elsewhere. And Michael, can I add to that a little bit? I think yeah, this is also where scope 
you know, scope one, scope two versus scope three accounting comes into play too. Yeah. If yeah. I'm only looking at my scope one emissions and I say, okay, I'm using biomass, it's, you know, I'm going to count it as, yeah. as zero emission or even natural gas and, and, you know, the emissions of potentially extracting that in another country, compressing it, shipping it across an ocean, putting it in the, yeah. the pipeline, those can have pretty significant differences yeah. when you start to look yeah. at it from a scope three perspective. So I think that yeah. also helps really focus that um, as well. Yeah. Agreed. I have no idea. One last point that I'll make around the sequencing of fuel sources is this is something that's very near and dear to Apparel Impact Institute. Yeah. Um, so keep an eye on news related to our organization for um, research and work that, that we're seeking to kind of usher this transition, as Michael mentioned, um, looking out to an electrification strategy or process um, update or process innovation strategies for the industry. It's something that as we seek to fund projects that are going to contribute to the decarbonization of this industry, we want to be mindful in how we might fund certain projects on a transition path. And without uh, an indication of where that direction is, uh, it's kind of difficult to do. And so that's something that we're very keen to bring forward, um, both as an output of this kind of work, but also in support of additional efforts that the industry can bring forward. Awesome. All right. We are over time. We do have one question. How is the buying public responding to this program? Um, Joel, I think you might be most equipped to take that one. Really briefly, I think that, you know, PEF isn't out there yet. Uh, these aren't really out there yet. There's very minimal data um, in, in terms of actually looking at product holistically. So I don't think there's enough to really answer this question at this point. Yeah. Thanks you all. Yeah. And thanks for the question, Nikki. Yeah. Um, with that, I'd love to thank Michael, Beth, Joel for joining the panel today. Feel free to contact Michael or myself uh, with any questions following the, the discussion. Uh, as Michael mentioned, we'll send out the recording and a copy of the report by Monday. Uh, you can also look to our website for additional information and previous iterations of the report. Uh, for your reference. Uh, and thank you to all of the participants who joined today as well. Really appreciate the dialogue and ongoing Q&A that comes from these types of efforts. Uh, thanks so much and have a great weekend. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone.